I'm really looking forward to sharing this new series with you. It's called Becoming a Dynamic Duel. And I didn't actually name this. A very good friend of mine, a hiking friend of mine called Bob, calls Sally and I a dynamic duel. <laughs> and the reason he does it is that we complement each other. We, her strengths, you know, complement me and my strengths complement her. And, and we've learned how to work together in and through Jesus Christ. And when you learn how to do that, you actually become a dynamic duel. That's what God designed marriage to be. It's very complementary, but most marriages are not in that state today. And a lot of people are confused on how to bring their marriage into that dynamics of what God designed marriage to be. And it's not complicated at all. It's actually very simple. Now, it's simple in understanding. I'm going to share two simple principles with you that if you follow them, I can guarantee you that you'll become a dynamic duel. And it doesn't matter if your marriage is uh, good, it can be better. If it's better, it can be best. Some people's uh, marriages need to be rescued from the rocks uh, where they're at. That, that marriage too can become a dynamic duel. When some other marriages need to be moved off dead center, <laughs> they're just plateaued. And it's sad because people come into the church and they see perhaps a, a good mental ascent to truth, but they don't see people in love and, and working together. And, and that's the cement that really puts it all together. So I want to talk to you about how to take your marriage. And I'm going to be speaking from marriages that I've helped with these two principles. And they first originated with our marriage, Sally's and my marriage. It wasn't always a dynamic duel. D-U-A-L. Sometimes it was a duel, D-U-E-L. And we don't want that in your marriage. We want it to be what God designed it to be. So I'm going to start out by sharing probably the most tragic situation in my 40 years of uh, counseling with people, working with marriages, helping to restore them. And uh, the couple is Bob and Mary. When I share their situation, I want you to know that what happened to them is happening all across the country. And it's happening in, in Christian marriages, and it's happening in non-Christian marriages. It's not unusual. Now, their circumstances may not be your circumstances, but if I can show you the worst possible circumstance that I had to deal with in the past 40 years, or my wife and I, along with God, of course, because it's not Jim and Sally, it's Jim and Sally connect, connected with God. So the worst circumstance we ever had to, and it became beautiful. It was restored. And I'm hoping when you hear their story and what it took uh, with the two simple principles to bring it back to life as God designed it to be, that there'll be hope for you and that you'll desire to not only enter into these two simple principles that God designed, but that you'll share it with others, that you'll tell people, come to this, this series. And it's a five-part series, by the way. So this is part one of it. And the, the title on this one is Two Simple Principles. And my thoughts are taken from uh, John 15, verse 12. My prescription to heal you. This is what God's saying. My prescription, God's prescription to heal you, your marriage, the two of you, uh, is this, love each other, and here's the big word, as I have loved you. So let's, let's explore that as word here if, you, if we can. Very simple Bible verse, but um, the application of it is greatly lacking in the world, in the nations, and in the churches today. So I was at home. Early in the morning, I received a phone call from Mary. And she, uh, Bob had been out of state, her husband at the time. And she says, Jim, you call Bob and tell him if he flies home tonight, I'm going to meet him at the door with a scalpel and he's going to lose something. Mary was a surgical nurse. And I said, Whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute, Mary. What, what's going on? You, you want me to call your husband, and I know him personally, I know this couple, and tell him not to come home tonight? Don't fly home because you're going to meet him with a surgical scalpel? He's going to lose some weight? 
wait a minute, back, back up, will you? And she says, listen, when I got up this morning, Bob had sent me a voicemail on the phone at three o'clock in the morning telling me he had slept with another woman that night. And she says, Jim, you need to call him. I do not want to see him. So I called Bob. I said, Bob, I told him the story that, that I just received. And I said, what's up, Bob? And Bob was, at least on the phone with me, he was very remorseful. He was regretful. He was, he was down. He was, he was disheartened. Uh, he had been away from home and things got out of hand and uh, he hadn't planned it, but it was not intentional, but it happened. I mean, what a tragic situation for any marriage. Bob could have hit it though, uh, but he didn't. He was owning his failure. And I said, Bob, she wants to know why you, you would leave a voicemail. He says, Jim, I knew if I didn't confess it right now, I never would. And he says, I was afraid to face her. So the best that I could do, whether you agree with it or not, you got to give the guy some credit. I mean, he admitted it. He confessed it. He got it, he got it off his heart and he put it out there front. Now they've got to work through this tragic situation. So he owned it. I think in the scriptures, King David, one of the great, he wrote the Psalms. He didn't own his tragic failure, not until Nathan the prophet came and actually eked it out of him. So let's give Bob a little bit of room here. He says, so I told him, I says, Mary does not want you to come home tonight. And he says, Jim, we've got some financial hardships and I can't afford a hotel room. And he says, you tell her that not my name is on the deed and I'm walking through that front door tonight. I'm going like, ay, 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 ay. there's gonna be a bloodbath at the front door. Why? Because they are both in charge. Even though Mary's going through a tragic emotional uh, heartbreak in her life, she's still in charge. And Bob, even though he's confessed uh, his wrong, his sin, he's still in charge. And that's the problem in marriages one or both are in charge. And you've got to ask yourself right now, is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about what you are in charge of, what you don't want to let go of, what you want to control in the marriage? Ask yourself that question. So what do they need to do to get through this? Well, there's two simple principles. The first principle is very simple. It's coming under God. They need to be under God. The, the reason Sally's in my marriage is a dynamic duel is Sally remains under God. I remain under God. We filter everything through God. I always do what's best for her. She always does what's best for me. And it makes us dynamic. It's beautiful. It's lovely. It's what God designed to be. So number one, they need to come under God. Mary needs to come under God right now because our only safety and our only security is in God. It's not just in our knowledge of God's principles, but it's in putting ourselves under God with those principles. This is not an easy situation because this is a very tragic, emotional, lots of feelings involved, but she, she's got to rise above her emotions. She has to rise above her feelings. She's got to rise above her victimhood and her hurt, and she's got to make Bob a priority. <laughs> yes, that's right. You see, Bob, um, Bob had not made Mary a priority. For Bob, his football, his uh, hunting, uh, his fishing, his golfing, his his news is uh, all competed with Mary for his affections. And Mary was on the bottom of the totem pole with Bob and she knew it. And she's wrestling now with, with her emotions and her feelings. She, she wants revenge. She wants judges, justice. She doesn't, she doesn't want to see him. She wants to lash out. She's disgusted and hurt and wounded. And all that's going on in marriages today. Now, it may not be with the same situation as Bob and Mary, but in your situation, all those are elements of what split up marriages and keep them 
um, coexistent or plateaued or on rock bottom. So will Mary follow God or will she follow her emotions? And so I was talking with Mary about that God was whispering to her conscience on what she is supposed to do at this particular time. So poor Mary, I mean, she's just crying out for, for her hurt, for her wound, for her victimization. And that's on one side of Mary. And on the other side is a still small voice saying, Mary, listen to me. I have a solution for your dilemma. Follow me, not your feelings, not your emotions. And most of us have desensitized our consciences to God because we don't, we don't follow those consciences very often. We ignore God when he comes and he knocks on the door of our heart, if I can say that way. And we have a choice every day. Every day God knocks on the door of my heart. Every day God knocks on the door of your heart. And he's always trying to direct us to improve our life, to bring it under his holy principles to bring our marriages into oneness with him. And we always have that choice and we can decide and we can enlighten that conscience by reading God's word. That's why I read God's word is to enlighten my conscience. So that when God knocks on the door of my heart, I know the choice that I'm gonna go with. So I line up with God and his word, his truth, rather than what Jim Holmberger thinks. And then when we start to recognize that, we need to act upon it whether it's a simple situation or it's a very uh, precarious situation as these two have found themselves in. So God speaks directly to everybody's conscience. He's no respecter of persons. Isaiah 30, 21 says, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, Mary, this is what I would have you to do. Bob, this is what I'm calling you to do. And if we will filter that through our emotions and our, our thoughts, our revenge, whatever it may be, or in Bob's case, now his, his right to, to walk into his home and not go get a hotel, if we'll filter all that, then, then we can hear what God is saying. So what do you think God is saying to Mary right now? I would, I would if I could listen in on Mary's conscience between her and God, I'd, be, I'd suggest that God is saying, Mary, Put down the scalpel. Put away your revenge. Forgive Bob. He's confessed his wrongdoing. He's confessed his sin. He's confessed his failure. How many of us have failed? You know, I've failed. I've had to seek God's forgiveness. My wife has. You have. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is a big one for a marriage. Grant you that but still it has to be treated the same. So God forgives us. So if God forgives us, do we forgive others? We're called to forgive others as God forgives us. God forgave King David of his, his adultery and murder and cover up. Pretty big, right? I mean, if God can forgive David for that, cannot Mary forgive Bob? That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It starts with forgiveness for all of us. We can all hear God whispering to us in the moment if we tune in. And the devil's always trying to get us to listen to our feelings, our, our human reasoning, or things of the world. And so all those things cloud God's still small voice to us, but we can still tune into it if we choose to. And even in this situation, Bob and Mary can tune in to what God is saying to them, or they can tune out. I wonder what your percentage is. If, if we could send off an email to the throne of grace and say, Lord, what is my percentage for listening to you yesterday, last week, last month, for the past year? What do you think your percentage would be of how many times God has called to your heart and you responded in a positive fashion? Do you get, think you might get 25%? Maybe a good Christian might get 50. What was Jesus' percentage? 100%. And that's the problem with humanity. We tune God out. So we all need to become so sensitive to the still small voice 
of Jesus whispering to our soul that the lightest whisper, even in a tragic situation, can move us to do what God would have us to do. That's the first principle. It's coming under God. And it's not just in a tragic situation. It's in all things in our life throughout the day, no matter what they are. There is only one question all of us need to ask. And that question is, it's in Acts verse 9, verse 6. It's, Lord, what would thou have me to do? That's, that's the only question we ever have to ask in any situation in life. Lord, what would thou have me to do? And that's what I, I was counseling Mary and Bob to do. You've got to tune in to God right now. You've got to ask God, what do you want me to do? Because God is your strength. He's your safety. He's your security. He knows the so solution to your problem. You don't. I don't. The church doesn't. But God does. So our job is to connect you with God, not merely the church, not merely a counselor, but God. So my responsibility with Bob and Mary right now is to connect them to the God of heaven. Are you tuned in? I can remember, I'm just diverse here just a little bit, but Sal and I came back from a month long of speaking engagement in South Africa. And boy, when we got back, we were tired. We had a ton of clothes that needed to be done. I mean, if you've ever been gone for a month, so we're back and we put all the clothes by the washing machine and Sally was doing them. And I was trying to get my emails done and answering phone calls. And, and I came in from the back door and I walked through our washing machine room and there's all these clothes that need to be ironed. And I want to go up to my, my uh, desk and prepare another sermon that had to be out that weekend. What do you think God is saying to Jim Holmberger right now? Do the ironing. Lord, I don't want to do the ironing. So what's the one question I've got to ask? Simple situation compared to theirs, right? But if I don't tune into God when he calls me to do the ironing instead of what I want to do at my desk, will I tune into God in a tragic situation? Probably not. So I, I did the ironing instead of what I want to do. That's being part of a dynamic duel with God at the center of that duel. That's what he calls us to all day long. How are you scoring on that when God calls you? So what is God impressing upon God? Bob's conscience right now. He's probably saying to Bob, you need to say you're sorry, not just in a voicemail, but in person, face to face, eye to eye. She wants to look into your eyes. She wants to look at your confidence. She wants to see if there's true sorrow there. I'm sure that's what Bob, Bob is wrestling with with God right now. He's probably saying to Bob, treat Mary gently. She's hurt. She's wounded. She's suffering. So Bob's struggle right now is whether he has a right to his home, which he does. His name's on the deed. It's his home. He's got a key to the front door. He can just walk through that front door. Or he can be tuning in to Mary's struggle. So which one do you do in your marriage relationship? Are you, are you demanding your rights? Or are you tuning in to the other person's struggle? Which one is it? And the only question you have to ask then is, Lord, what do you want me to do in this tragic situation? So he's, I'm sure God is asking for Bob to humble himself and to sacrifice his rights and to ask permission to enter the home before he just barges through it. So there's just that one question. Will Bob ask that question? Lord, so Bob is now flying home, Mary's home. So this is the first principle, coming under God. It's what Lucifer uh, lost out on. Lucifer didn't come under God. He wanted to manage himself. Then Adam and Eve didn't come under God. They wanted to manage themselves. What about you and I? When we learn to come under God in all things, and our percentage increases, maybe you're at 50% of cooperation, God, maybe 75, maybe 80. God's trying to call us higher and higher and higher and higher. So we walk as Jesus walked. 
fully and completely dependent upon a power outside of ourselves. And that power is Jesus Christ. And we're guided by that through his word. It is giving ourselves over to that power. Will Bob and Mary do this? Because if they do, there's hope. There's hope for them. If they don't, they're going to go to the flesh. And you know what that is. So will they be born again? See, born again happens every day with me. Paul says, I die daily. Every day I renew my commitment to say, come into me, Lord Jesus. Be my wisdom. Be my power. May I filter everything through you. Being a born again is a person that allows Christ to be in charge of their life instead of themselves. And now Bob and Mary have to deal with whether they're going to be born again at this moment. What about you? Were you born again today? Last time you had an argument, did you let Christ in? Did you let that power in? That's becoming a wise virgin instead of just a foolish virgin. Isn't just having the knowledge of right and wrong from God's word, but it's allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to come in and empower you to live that word. That's what has to happen. That's the first principle. Are you in it? Most Christians are not. The second principle is very simple. It's prioritizing your spouse every day. Every day, I make Sally a priority. I, when I was sitting up preparing this message this morning, I was going through it and I saw Sally run out and start picking from a raspberry patch. She likes to pick very early before that sun gets high and hot. And the uh, Lord just whispered to me, Jim, go down and make the bed. Well, I assume that Sally made it. She usually does, but God asked me to go down. So I left my desk. I said, is that you, Lord? Yes. So I went down, the bed was made. But God wanted to see if I was willing to put Sally first, to prioritize her, to sacrifice my time, my energy, what I want to do for her benefit. I didn't have to make the bed, but I received the benefit of knowing that I would make it for her. So these two principles, if they're combined together, and if they're lived out daily, they will revitalize your marriage. They will empower your marriage, guaranteed. But it takes two of you to be a dynamic duel. So how does Mary need to prioritize Bob now? Love always puts the other person first. That's what Calvary is about. Father, forgive them for they know what to do. Love put the needs of the sinner before the life of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's how you become a dynamic duel in your marriage. You always put the needs of the other person before yours. Will Mary do that? Mary needs to put herself into Bob's shoes, not hers. You say, well, Jim, this is tragic. Yes, it is. But God always puts himself in my shoes first. Yeah. And that's who we follow as Christians. There's only one real way to show love, and that's by sacrifice. Mary, will you sacrifice yourself on the benefit for your husband right now? Ouch. Ooh. It's quite a calling, isn't it? Will you forgive him amidst your hurt? Now, not a month from now, but now. In this very moment, Jesus says, we forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. Otherwise, what, what he's saying is we perpetually forgive others. That's what he does for us. I wonder if I could look at my, my, my file in heaven, how many times God has had to forgive Jim Oberger. <laughs> I'd, hate, I'd hate to think of what the number is. Praise God, he's a forgiving God. Well, if we're his follower, we need to be forgiving people. We need to be forgiving spouses in all situations. So why has God recorded the sins and failures of his people? Like David, because we're all failing human beings. 
we all have weaknesses. I mean, David was this great young lad that slew Goliath. I mean, come on. But then he failed when he became king, committed adultery with Bathsheba, murdered her husband Uriah, then covered it up and God had to send his prophet Nathan to bring it out of him, if you will. But David returned to God. He repented. And today we, we read his Psalms. We don't go to our Bibles and tear the whole book of Psalms out and throw it away because David committed adultery, because he was a murderer, and because he covered it up. He repented. And when you repent, the, the slate is cleared. It's free. You no longer see the sin. And that's what Mary has to do with Bob because Bob has confessed his sin. He's willing to repent. And now Mary is called to do what God does for you and I. And what we all need to do in the marriage. If she doesn't, you can't become a dynamic duel. You can't hold revenge. You can't be a victim. You've got to enter the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I ask you, what does Mary need to do? She needs to find compassion for Bob. Yes. And you can't do that in that circumstance unless you let Christ in, because you don't have the power in your flesh to accomplish that. That's why we always need God. That's why we're Christians. We need a power outside of ourselves to enable us to do what God calls us to, because these are difficult things in her circumstance. She needs to meet Bob at the door with an open heart, not a scalpel. And when I'm sharing this with, with her, I mean, she is really wrestling. Because Bob's a big one at fault, not her. But God's calling her to have the compassion and to come under God. So she needs to prioritize her husband above her feelings, above her emotions. That's what a Christian always does. But that's what Christians are not doing. And that's why when the world looks at Christians today, they don't seem any different than the people in the world. No power. No power. If Christians could see Mary empowered in the worst circumstance of her entire marriage, they'd have to say, I want what she's got. I want that power. And that power is Christ in you. That's why Christianity is different than all the other religions in the world, because it has the only power source to enable you to live God's word. She has to be sensitive to her conscience, whispering to her and cooperate. Is this easy? It's very hard. Yes, it is. But it can be done. So I have a question for you. Do you want to advance your marriage? Do you want to rescue it from the rocks? Do you want to move your marriage off from dead center? Do you want to take your marriage from good to better to best? If you do, then you prioritize your spouse every day. And I do that with Sally. I was tested this morning. Go make the bed, Jim. I didn't have to make it, but I was tested. Will you put Sally before uh, preparing for this message? Yes, Lord, I will. She's numero uno, number one. She's a priority. Then you prioritize your spouse. I can remember in the fall when I came home from hiking, climbing a 14,000-foot peak, I was exhausted. I'd hiked 10 miles, climbed a 14,000-foot peak, came home, and Sally was canning our tomatoes from our, our garden, our organic garden. I came to the house. I was exhausted. I mean, I'm, I turned 74 this year. That's quite a feat for a 74-year-old, by the way. So I sit down in my, my uh, lazy boy chair, and I'm looking at Sally in the kitchen. There's all kinds of things. What is God calling me to do? Prioritize Sally. <laughs> but I'm tired, Lord. Well, your wife is tired, too, and she needs help. What does prioritizing your spouse mean? Only when it's convenient? No. So I got out a lazy boy chair and I started cleaning up the, the cans and right in the kitchen I'm sitting in right now. And she just looks over and she winks at me and she didn't say anything, but we're a dynamic duel. We work together. 
Most marriages are a dynamic duel, D-U-E-L. They're always dueling with each other, always knocking their heads, no sacrificing. And we wonder why there's no power in the church. We wonder why the, the, the world doesn't want our church, doesn't want our doctrines, because they see us in a duel, D-U-E-L, versus a dynamic duel working together. What's it like in your church? So, love begets love, honestly. So Jim made the bed. So I made the bed. I did the ironing. Those are typically my duties. I help clean up the kitchen. So what, what does Bob need to do right now? Honestly, no. He needs to be humble. He needs to be sorrowful. He needs to be considerate of what Mary's wrestling with. He needs to show concern and care for Mary, honestly. He needs to, yes, confess his sins. He needs to ask for forgiveness. First John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. But he needs to confess that so Mary can forgive him and they can have a clean slate and they can go on with their marriage. He needs to give Mary an assurance of the future, that this is never gonna happen in the future. He needs to make Mary the priority, uh, not his need for a place to sleep. So he needs to listen to his conscience and he needs to act. And that's what you and I need to do every day. We need to listen to our conscience and act. And we read the word of God because it gives us the, the principles for living. And then our conscience calls us to live out those principles. And then we filter all that and we say, yes, God, I'm your servant. I will do what you call me to do. So he's listening to his conscience and he needs now, not just in this moment, but the rest of his married life, he needs to put Mary at the top of the totem pole not his sports, uh, not his internet, not his news, not his buddies. Mary needs to become numero uno, number one, if you're going to be a dynamic duel. So what happened? So this was the worst day of their married life. So Bob came to the front door, and he could have just walked in. But he didn't. He rang the doorbell. What is he doing? He's asking permission. He's saying, can I come in? I'm sorry. Just with that simple act, he didn't just barge in and take the right of his home and say, I'm here. He rings the doorbell. He's got a key to the front door. Mary is standing in the kitchen with her scalpel. She put the scalpel down, she went to the door, and she just stood there. And he rang the doorbell again. Both of them are doing what? Lord, what would thou have me to do? Acts 9, 6, Isaiah 30, 21. And then ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Both are coming under God, both are making each other a priority. Their flesh is not ruling them in the worst circumstance of their marriage. Yes! God's going to win, not the devil. So Mary slowly opens the door, and she looks at her husband. She looks right in his eyes. She wants to see if there's sorrow there. And Bob is standing there like a broken man, just... He's in tears, his, his shoulders are drooped down, and he, he's, he's like a little puppy, he's just like looking at his wife, you know, and just, just his confidence is saying, I'm sorry, I, I, I blew it, I, I've hurt you, I, I wanna make things right, can, can we come back together? And Mary senses all that, not even a word is exchanged yet. Mary senses all this, and she begins to just cry because she sees the repentance in his continence. She sees him pushing the doorbell, just standing there, not, not entering, waiting for permission. 
<laughs> Not complicated, is it? Coming under God and making him a priority. And she puts her arms out just like that. They embraced each other. She forgave him. He confessed his sin. I got a call. That was Friday night. I got a call on Monday, and they told me it was the best weekend of their marriage. <laughs> it almost brings tears to my eyes because every marriage can be healed. Every marriage can be a dynamic duel with God in it, with God as the center and with making each other priority. Because if they will do that, if they will follow two principles and ask one question, what's the question? Acts 9, 6, Lord, what would thou have me to do in the two principles? They'll come under God, and make each other priority. It's not complicated. It may stretch you because <laughs> you got some old habits and it works in all relationships. No matter what your relationship is, if, if, if it's in a family situation, if it's a friendship, if it's a church member or somebody at work, in all situations, this works because it's a principle. It doesn't just work in a marriage. After I became a Christian and, and believed in the Bible and put away my drinking, my smoking, my bad language and all that, my older brother threw me out. He thought I was a nutcase. You're no fun anymore, Jim. And there became a, a wall between my older brother and myself. And I was praying to God on how to fix that. And my, we moved from Wisconsin to Montana in the wilderness. A number of years had passed. And my mother calls me and she says, son, your brother Carl has sold his home and he's gonna be moving in a couple of days and he doesn't have anybody to help him. I said, mom, that's 1600 miles. You want me to take my whole family and the cost of the gas to get in a hotel room and in between and, and just can't somebody help him there? And my mother just said, my Roman Catholic mother, by the way, <laughs> says, to, says to this Protestant, <laughs> Bible believing Protestant, just talk to your God. <laughs> so what do you think God asked me to do? My brother thinks I'm, I'm a nutcase. There's a huge barrier between us. And I'm supposed to do all this for him? Really? But I've been praying that God would restore our relationship. So I went to my knees and the Lord said, go, go. So we went, we arrived at his house, seven o'clock at night, knocked at the door. He comes to the door. This is my Roman Catholic brother who thinks his Protestant brother's a nutcase. And he stands there and he looks at me. He looks at my wife. He looks at my two sons. What are you doing here? I said, Carl, we've come to help you. You need help. And we're not leaving until... Your other home is perfectly cleaned and ready for the new occupants and that everything is put exactly where you want it in the new home. We are here to help you. It broke his heart. Why? Because I came under God. I didn't do what was best for me. I did what was best for him and he knew it. In that moment at the door, he analyzed all this in split seconds, and he's, he's weighing the cost that there was, and he's weighing that he was worth the price. It, it works in all relationships. If you'll come under God, and you'll make the other person a priority. So we came under God, and we made Carl a priority. You know what? He says, can I have a couple of your books? I want to read them. When we left, it took us a week. Now he was interested in our belief system, in our Jesus. Why? Because he saw it in action. That's why. Because he had value. And we're willing to sacrifice our time, our finances, our whole family for his benefit. I'm sure God is whispering to you right now, this very moment. He promises, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we can boldly say, 
God is my helper, Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. God says, I know how to restore any relationship. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's with your parents. Maybe it's with your siblings or your children or relatives, whoever. God says, I'm your helper. If you will come under me and you'll make what I bring to you a priority, it works. We all have the assurance of God's constant presence. And he promises he'll supply all our need. So if you're not even a Christian, God will be there for you. You don't have to be a, a Bible-believing Protestant Christian going to a conservative Christian for God to be there for you. He's there for everybody in the world, regardless of where they stand. He says, I'm there for you. Let me prove my love for you. Let me show you the benefit of attaching yourself to me. And your past doesn't negate my love for you. Regardless of how you behave, regardless of what you, you've been, my, regardless of your past, I'll still be there for you. I can remember when, when uh, I graduated from high school and I wanted to go on to college and, and I hadn't become a Christian yet. I hadn't even read the Bible ever. Uh, I, I was a party guy and I couldn't get the money to go out of state to college. And I was working at a standard oil gas station Richest man in the county drives in, big Lincoln Continental. He goes into the office, gas station office. I pump his car with gas, and a, a friend of mine drives up. Tom, his name is. He says, Jim, did you get that uh, loan to go to college? I said, no, they won't give it to me. I can't go. And so this man, the richest man in the county, is listening to me talk to my high school buddy. And I come in, and he hands me his card. He says, come and see me on Tuesday afternoon. Two o'clock. So I go and see him Tuesday afternoon, two o'clock. He said, uh, so you need help? I says, yes, how much you need? I told him. And he pulls out a checkbook, writes out the check, hands me a check, and says, come and see me at the end of every quarter. And as long as you have a B plus average, a 3.0 average, I'll give you another check. And I'm going like, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I said, don't I need to sign something or do something? He says, are you a Christian? I said, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I wasn't a Christian, but I didn't want to blow that one. He says, I says, well, I'm a Roman Catholic. He says, I don't care what religion you are. Are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. I wasn't a Christian. And he says, then pass it on when you're able. And I've done that many, many, many times. What is God doing? He's shown his love for Jim Homer. I'm out drinking, I'm out smoking, I'm out swearing, I'm doing things that, that, that are against his word, and he still reaches out to you. That's my God. Why? Because God wants me and him to be a dynamic duel. Yeah, that's my power source today. So first, I'm a dynamic duel with God. And that dynamic duel of Jim Hornberger and God allows me to set up another dynamic duel with Jim and Sally, my queen. And he's at the center of it. And you know, he does it for everybody. He'll do it for you. He's done it for me. He'll do it for anybody. You just have to be willing to take that step to come under God. And he's calling you now. Will you come under God and make that the priority of your life? If you will, your marriage can be a dynamic duel. Stay tuned for part two. God bless you.